as soon as Great, so uh, welcome uh, everybody to this uh, day of uh, uh, lectures. Um, so before we start, I want to remind a few uh, rules on how to uh, interact with, uh, uh, with the speakers to ask questions. So if you are following from YouTube, um, you can ask questions in the chat. Uh, if you are following from Zoom, you can either ask questions. I, mean, I know you are familiar with this, but it's always useful to repeat them. You can either uh, ask questions in the chat or use the raise hand button uh, of Zoom. So I think we can start with the first lecture. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, um, Sandro Azzaele. Sandro is a professor at the University of uh, uh, Padova and is broadly interested in mathematical modeling of biological systems and has given many contributions to um, the interface between stochastic processes and ecological dynamics. And uh, today is giving a lectures on uh, uh, community patterns and uh, uh, upscale. So thank you very much, uh, Sandro, for being with us and uh, please start when you, when you are ready. Okay, thank you, Jacopo. Um, <clears throat> let me. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, it works. Okay. Okay, I think that uh, we can start whenever, whenever you want. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Jacopo, for taking care of this and for this nice uh, invitation. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, second lecture. This is a second lecture out of three. The first one was given by Amos Maritan. The third one will be given by Samir Subais tomorrow. Uh, the first one was given by uh, Amos on an, let's say, a, an independent, model independent approach to uh, community patterns. Uh, Samir and myself are going to give instead a, a lecture, two lectures on model dependent approach. In particular, I'm going to uh, say something about neutral theory and uh, upscaling biodiversity and Samir is going to tell us something more about community patterns in uh, resource, consumer resource models. So <clears throat> this is a, a kind of the plan of the three lectures. So why, uh, let, me, let me give you a, a bit of a motivation here. Why are we going to care about modeling uh, community patterns? So in here, <clears throat> uh, we would like, let's say, to understand how, um, um, how these uh, communities, how these patterns that we observe in communities uh, emerge from underlying rules. So we want to understand, for example, uh, whether they are stable, whether why they are complex and in what sense they are complex. And if there is a relation between complexity of these communities and stability of their, of their of their status. Uh, this is a long-standing problem, but uh, it's important to understand uh, to a certain extent uh, to what degree these patterns that we observe are the result of a contingency to a certain extent or uh, universality. So what we observe is, is, something, uh, is something that uh, is because is universal that I mean goes, uh, it affects all uh, pattern that we observe, or is it something that uh, strongly depends on the detail of the uh, underlying individuals or underlying components of these patterns? So this is, uh, let's say, the theoretical side on one hand, but there is also, a, uh, let's say, a practical side, an applied side. So we would like to understand how ecosystem react when they are perturbed and uh, whether we can come up with some uh, conservation strategies uh, to, to improve their, their stuff. 
uh, it's important on the, uh, to, to highlight also the fact that uh, prediction here, we would like to understand uh, um, the mechanisms underlying these patterns on one hand uh, to make predictions, but it's also possible to make predictions without understanding, although this is not always safe. But, you know, we live in the, in the era of the data deluge. And uh, if you have a good algorithm, algorithm which can learn from the data, then you can infer some, uh, uh, some properties and you can make some predictions. But this is not what I'm going to do today. Uh, although it's, it's an interesting uh, side of this, uh, <clears throat> of this uh, study. So another important uh, thing to understand is that the mechanism, mechanisms that we would like to understand um, usually operate at different scales with respect to the, to the scale of the patterns which we observe. This is an important point. For example, uh, when we observe patterns, we have to introduce some windows of observations, and these windows introduce some, uh, uh, some biases. For example, we could have some finite size effects, some spurious correlations, or some sampling effects. And this is, we have, uh, it is important that we are aware of this, of this problem. In general, our standpoint is that community patterns in general emerge because there is, they are the result of a collective behavior of uh, interacting units. And from these patterns, we would like to identify key mechanisms, key mechanisms which, uh, from which we can uh, derive this uh, macroscopic, macroscopic pattern. All this is uh, a fantastic challenge, <clears throat> but uh, what I've just said, the fact that mechanisms may vary across scales and they reverberate on scales of generation, um, make, um, make, suggest an important point. We have to be aware that when we observe the world, we are wearing a kind of a thick pair of glasses, okay? So it may well be that what we observe um, is not something very interesting. What, uh, what, let me, let me a bit, uh, let me be a bit clearer about this. So we, the first form of uh, the forming lengths is randomness, like, a, like a, a written, you can read here. So it may be that what, what we observe, the patterns that we measure are somehow basically are not <clears throat> the result of mechanism. It, may, it might be that they are not the result of mechanism, but simply a result of random associations. This is a kind of a problem to a certain extent because of course, when we measure something and we want to infer the mechanism, the mechanism, we would like to, uh, we many times assume that there are mechanisms by which we obtain these, these patterns. However, this is not always the case. Uh, and uh, there is an interesting paper here by Mazzolini et al, who highlighted this problem and uh, showed that basically we have to take care of this problem because uh, for example, complex systems, uh, many of them are modular, which means that they are made out of, uh, made out of components like, uh, like Lego bricks. Uh, with Lego bricks, we can do Lego sets. And from this, uh, because, of th because we have a list of instructions, we can come up with a Lego set uh, and because we have, a, uh, let's say, a, a target architecture, right? So um, in this case, it's clear that the Lego bricks and on one hand and the, the, the list, the, the, the Lego sets, the, the, the final, the target architecture, there is a strong link between the two. However, in general, when we have functional, uh, <clears throat> when we have ecosystems, usually it's not, it's not clear uh, what kind of functional design or constraints um, are, are, are uh, in place. So uh, they, these are not clear a priori, right? So, because, for example, we could have some components that are like in, Lego, like in the Lego sets, we have some bricks that are small. Usually we have very many of them, but some other, which are larger, we have just a few of them. However, when we combine them, the number of these different Lego bricks are different, and this introduces some heterogeneity in the system. And this heterogeneity in the system makes some combinations more likely than others. It's just a kind of a, an entropy effect which we, we, which we must be uh, uh, aware of. So, <clears throat> uh, because 
for, and this is a problem not only uh, that is not not only a problem that is present in eco in ecology, but also, for example, in bacterial genomes or in linguistics when we analyze book chapters and many other many other uh, patterns. For example. Uh, there are situations in which you can have uh, um, horizontal gene transfer in which the randomness is present, but there are also other components that are not as important as this or the other way around. So we have to make sure that what we, what we observe is important, uh, is driven by an underlying mechanism. So uh, <clears throat> how do we do that? Basically, the idea is to build up some, some uh, known model uh, and now we are going to see one of them, some known models from which we can see, uh, so basically we can derive from uh, uh, whether they work or not. So basically these known models are informative when they fail. This is the basic idea. When they fail, we see that probably there is a mechanism, there is something, um, uh, <coughs> there is something uh, underlying the, the pattern that is probably interesting. So, and this tells us whether there are specific arch uh, architectural features in our, um, in our um, patterns. So now let, um, let me start with, with this kind of, a, of, of, of introduction, long introduction. Let me start with the first pattern here, which is probably um, one of the, is very well known probably to many of you here. So is the species area relationship here? So this gives you just the mean number of species as a function of the area, okay? And this is quite is very is very well studied by ecologists. We know very many things about this. But let me start the idea, and this is something that I, I think should be clarified. Like I said, not only in ecology but in many many other many other areas. So here. Uh, let me give you an example. We have a set of islands here, the Galapagos Islands, and here we have the area, and, the, and the, in, a, in each and every area we count the number of species. So here we are not looking at populations, just number of species. Okay, if you put on one, on the x-axis, the log of the area, and on the y-axis, the log of the number of species, you get these points here, the, these uh, green spots here, and you can draw a straight line. This means that you have a power law, right? So <clears throat> from this, uh, now the question uh, is here. So can we obtain this sort of pattern by placing at random individuals in space? This is the question. This is what I had uh, in mind before. So do we have this kind of lens, the forming lens? Is this a pattern that comes from something that from a mechanism on from an underlying mechanism or not. Usually what uh, ecologists do is basically they don't care about this uh, sometimes, not all of them, but sometimes they don't care about this and they say, okay, let's uh, draw a straight line. This is just proportional to A to the power of Z, where Z is always smaller than one. So always, and usually greater than dot two. Okay, what happens in this case? Uh, Let's try to put at random these individuals in space. So we have species I has an I individuals uh, within some total area capital A, and then we place at random this uh, <clears throat> over, over an area. Now, if uh, we want to look at the number of individuals uh, in that form within the area small a, we get that the probability that at least one in, uh, at least one of these individuals, at least one of uh, individual. Uh, may fall within a uh, small a is given by this expression here. So one minus a over uh, capital A is just the probability that no individual falls here and this um, one individual and this is for the entire species. Now, if you do the calculation, you end up with the equation one with this formula one, which tells you that <clears throat> uh, it tells you that, okay, if we assume, if we assume to know uh, uh, the distribution of individuals uh, among species, okay, then the species area relation that we should get is just, is simply given by this expression here. Now, uh, if you want, there is a homework here, you can calculate the variance of this. So basically uh, you can assume that you have, you are given a uh, Bernoulli random variable uh, with uh, which gets uh, one when the, uh, when an individual species I falls within area small a and the probability is given by this expression here and otherwise is zero. Uh, 
So this gives you the average value, but you can calculate the variance as well. It's not difficult, and you can find already the, the answer in equation two of this paper here, which is very interesting, although it is quite old. So what happens when we go ahead and we try to compare this with the data? This is what we get. So if you go out there and you collect the data from the Lambert tropical forest or the Paso tropical forest, you get, uh, I mean, the, the, the black dots here uh, are those given from the empirical data, but the random placement model is the one, is the dashed line. So as you can see, is here and here. And this is kind of a common behavior. So basically, the idea here, uh, as you can see, you get a systematic overestimation of the number of species at all spatial scales. So it means that somehow here, um, uh, somehow, let's say, this is good news. So there is some work to be done. Uh, somehow, we see that the patterns that uh, the species area relationship basically has something to tell us, uh, something more important than just randomness. And this is also true for other patterns that we are going to see uh, in a minute. The reason why uh, here I've shown you that uh, the, <clears throat> the random placement always overestimates. So the reason for this is that uh, you can see this, you can see the reason from this picture here. These are eight different vascular plant species in the Paso forest. You see, they don't look uh, randomly placed in uh, space, they look aggregated. And this is something that now um, basically all ecologists have understood in the sense that randomness uh, is one component, but is not the most important one. And usually species, uh, vascular plant species are aggregated in space. And if we want to model this, we, we, if we want to model spatial distribution of species, we have to take care of this um, of this um, <clears throat> aggregation in space. So, okay, let me just do a first summary. This is the first, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, this is the first uh, a summary of the first part, very simple, but I would like to make things clear. So we have the species of the, the species area relationship and many other, uh, which basically are not just the result of random association. We need, we need more. So there is more work to be done here. On the other hand, this SIR is subadditive in the sense that if we, if we double the sampled area, then um, we don't double the, the number of species, but we get uh, a, a smaller number, and this is a smaller number of species, and this is because the Z uh, exponent that I've shown before is smaller than one. And uh, usually ecologists use this power law, but there is no compelling theoretical reason for that. So basically, if you, if you write down a model, uh, a spatial model, you can get something that is different from a power law, but in some regime is a power law. So basically, this is just a phenomenological approach. So don't worry if you, if you come up with a model that is not a power law, but fits the data, it's not, it's not a big deal. It's not a big problem. And finally, what we have learned is just the species are aggregated in space. So uh, this is a summary for the first part. Jacopo, I don't know if there is any question or I can go ahead. So far, I don't see any uh, hand raised nor any question in the chat. But uh, if you have any, please, uh, now is the time to ask. But I think we can move on and then. OK. Uh, OK, so there is now let me move on to the a second <clears throat> a second uh, um, empirical pattern, which is the species abundance distribution. So in this case, we look into the abundances of species. So before we have looked just at species, uh, uh, species riches, now we look into uh, populations and uh, how these populations are distributed across species. The uh, usual pattern that uh, the typical SAD is given by these two plots here. So on the left hand side, you have on the on the y axis, you have the number of species and on the x axis, you have the log, the log two of the number of individuals. This uh, usually you have a peak in the middle, even though not always is a, as, as big as this, but you have a peak in the middle. And, the, and this is the reason why usually we get this kind of uh, um, uh, log normal behavior, which is, uh, which is used by ecologists. And here you also have this rank abundance. So this is 
telling you that uh, there are just a few species with a lot of uh, individuals, but a long tail of fewer, uh, um, a long tail of many species with just a few, few individuals, rare species. Here there is another piece of another piece of homework. If you want, you can calculate the relation between the two, and you can see you can realize that one is proportional to the basically the inverse of the exceedance probability uh, of the other. Uh, so, if you want, I can give you the details. No problem with that. So, okay, these are two ways to uh, present the same piece of information. So, in here, let me give you a caveat here because it's important that we understand how we collect this data. You know that in tropical forest live many different kinds of species. We have creepy crawling creatures and chirping birds and trees and whatever. Are we going to put everything in this SAD? Uh, all the species are going to uh, be analyzed in this species among the distribution? The answer is no, no. And the reason for this is that if we, if we wanted to model this, it would be basically impossible to come up with something uh, reasonable. Basically, it's too complicated because we should calculate the probability that species one has n one individual, species two has n two individuals. But if we want to model this, we are we have to deal with hundreds of species. All of them are interacted in a, in a trivial way, and this interaction may vary across different spatial scales. So no no way there is currently basically we don't know how to to model quantitatively large scale spatial patterns in multitrophic communities when there are many species so the idea here is to uh, introduce a, an empirical model system so basically we focus just on ecosystems with one trophic level Okay, so, and in here we introduce some simplifying assumption. Here we have species of bees, uh, overflies, species of breeding birds, and so on. So, so in our case, we are going to focus just on plants in, in a forest. When individuals um, in, within this tropical, uh, within one, uh, within, let's say, these uh, ecosystems with one trophic level, individuals are roughly can be considered independent or they interact more or less in the same way and they are clumped, like I said before. So uh, in this way, we can introduce some simplifying assumptions. So in here, as um, Hubble has, uh, I mean, has, uh, as Hubble did uh, at the beginning of the millennium, uh, the simplifying assumption that he introduced is that uh, individuals basically of any species, of, of all species, interact, compete in the, same, in the same way. So they all have the same probability to give birth, dying, migrating, and so on and so forth. So the identity in this case is not important. And uh, even though it may, seems, it may seem that neutrality uh, is a very strong assumption. Basically, we are able to introduce some models which can justify and which can tell us more about uh, the patterns and macro scale. And although this assumption is completely, is completely false from an ecological point of view, it is very useful when we want to introduce some baseline community patterns, some kind of null models, null um, uh, models from which, from, um, from, the, devi uh, from the deviations of, uh, of which we can understand something more about the underlying mechanisms. So, okay. so. In, uh, if we make this assumption, then we have we have said that we <clears throat> we have said that the identity is not important. So we go from p of n one and two n s to p of n because we have basically one species in a given region. And here we can basically write down a master equation, which is here. Uh, this is telling you how it uh, uh, behaves. This probability of having uh, uh, a given number of species within individuals, we can write this um, uh, from one step to the other. When you simplify, you get the master equation. And if uh, B naught, which is the birth, the birth rate when there are zero individuals and D naught are zero, then this um, uh, master equation may have a steady state, which can be calculated in the following way. Uh, I'm going to uh, quickly about these technical details, but I can leave you all the slides so you can do all the calculation by yourselves. So 
Pn star can be calculated recursively and you end up with this expression Pn star is just the product of these ratios of birth and death rates. And because of an normalization, you can calculate explicitly this steady state. Now, with this in our hands, we can basically model tropical forest. The first assumption is just to say that uh, B of n is proportional to uh, n and D of n is proportional to n. If you do that, you plug this into the formula that I showed you before, you get what is called the Fischer log series, which is widespread and then has been studied many times and uh, is in good agreement in several, let's say, in several uh, ecosystems, although it can be improved. And the improvement is the following here. We can modify just by adding one constant, so Bn, uh, um, instead of n, we have plus r and plus delta. And thanks to this new expression, we can obtain two different mode, two different species abundant distributions. We can have this, which is the negative binomial, which goes back to uh, the fischer log series as r goes to zero. Or we can have this expression here, in which when c goes to zero, uh, uh, <clears throat> we recover fischer log series. Why two different expressions? Okay, these, have, uh, these are good, equally good to a certain extent when it comes to model uh, um, empirical patterns, but it turns out that the negative binomial has some interesting mathematical properties which are not shared by this other uh, S demo. And we are going to see in, in a few slides these mathematical properties. So when we compare uh, this model here, this model with the density depends to the data, we get this very good agreement with the data. And this is well known since 2005, more or less. So good agreement, although this is, uh, mm, uh, it doesn't imply that uh, we have neutral mechanism at uh, at the fundamental level, we are able to show that there is some degree of universality in these patterns that we observe. Uh, another thing that I would like to highlight is this x, the value of x, which is uh, very close to one. And uh, I, I, I would like you to bear in mind this value, these values here that are close because it will become important later on when we are going to model spatial degrees of freedom in. Uh, in uh, <clears throat> uh, neutral theory. So, okay, another summary now. So we have neutrality, which is at individual level, and it tells us that we have just per capita ecological equivalence among individuals. This is at individual level, not at species level, like MacArthur did in his uh, theory of island biogeography in, uh, in the 60s. Then uh, this is, the, I mean, the niche theory is in contrast to, um, to neutral theory because uh, niche theory uh, asserts that species coexist because they are identity, because they are able to partition limited resources. On the contrary, instead, neutral theory uh, confers lots of importance to stochasticity, to ecological drift, and basically it washes out the uh, all species identity. And because of this, it's able to recover some, to, to identify some underlying uh, universal patterns, uh, universal mechanisms. So as you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think that neutral theory is somehow useful because it helps uh, identifying these, these uh, universal drivers. And uh, uh, another warning here, neutral patterns here, of course, even though we are able with neutral theory to, um, let's say, to match the empirical data, this doesn't mean that there are in place neutral, neutral mechanisms. This is important because there are some other mechanisms, for example, uh, some other models which are non-neutral, like the hierarchical competitive model by Tillman, which can produce log series distribution even though they are non neutral. But um, that doesn't mean that it's tru uh, truer than, than neutral theory. Also, there may be some uh, life history trade offs which introduce some equalizing effect on birth and death rates, and therefore they make look like more neutral. Okay, this is a second part. Um, um, Jacopo, if there, is if there are questions? Uh, no, I don't see any uh, hand raised. 
Um, is there any question? Anyone that wants to ask something? We can move on, no problem with that. Everything is crystal clear. Maybe everything's clear. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or everything obscure. <laughs> Always one of the two extremes. But yes. <laughs> as as the first one. Okay, so let's move on now. Uh, okay, up to now we we've seen the species abundance distribution and the species area relationship. Now we would like to go ahead to move on and try to link them in uh, in uh, in with, with one uh, in in with one. Uh, approach with one model. So on one hand, when you, you see you have this forest, when you sample small areas, you get this species of the distribution with a mode that is basically at uh, when the number of individuals is very small. But then when you increase the sampled area, this mode goes into higher classes here. And so you move from, from small number of species up to large number of species. This is, uh, as you can see, this is clearly a kind of a sampling effect which is difficult to uh, to model and this is one of the reasons why for example in the upscaling problem that i'm going to explain later on uh, this is kind of a, a of a challenge so patterns are scale dependent and when we model this we have to look we have to be careful and we have to look into this problem so um, is it possible to come up? So here I've just shown you species area relationship and species abundance distribution, but there are very, there are many other patterns uh, in uh, that can be measured. Here is just a list. Species lifetime distribution is a pattern that involves time, pair correlation involves space, so on and so forth. Taylor's law. Okay, I don't want to look into the details of this, but the idea is to find out whether there is an underlying mathematical theory from which we can derive, uh, if not all these patterns, at least some of them. And now I, it, it is, uh, and now it's what I would like to explain you. So in here, uh, we start with a model which is basically defined on a lattice, okay? It's a meta-community model. So in every side, we put several individuals and there is no threshold on them. So we have, uh, and how, how does it work? It's just, it has uh, four uh, moves. So the first is a death move, a death move in which basically one individual here uh, <clears throat> or species of, of one species inside I dies at the rate of R. Then we have the birth move. So we have an individual and this produces one offspring at rate B. And this can hop onto one of the nearest neighbor size with probability one minus gamma. Finally, we have uh, that every site is colonized by a, a constant rain of propagules with the rate B naught. Now it's possible to write down the uh, birth and death rates of this model. And, uh, and therefore we can also write down the spatial uh, master equation for this model. Let me give you just highlights of the most important properties. It is species independent. There are just bas four basic mechanisms, birth, death, diffusion, and immigration. So basically in here, there is only uh, stoch uh, demographic stochasticity, no other effect. Uh, if, you, if you look at the mean, of, uh, the, the behavior of the mean is, is quite trivial. So the patterns here emerge simply because of demographic stochasticity. There, is no there are no um, environmental effects. And because the uh, birth and deaths are linear, there is no carrying capacity. So in here, B is always, must be always smaller than D. And uh, biodiversity, uh, so the states, the, the, the stationary state is non-trivial uh, when B0 is larger than zero. Uh, because of the term that I showed you here, this sum here, this tells you that we have uh, spatially aggregated species. And finally, this model is minimal in the sense that if you get rid of one or more of this parameter, basically, you end up with something that is trivial. So, with these patterns here now, uh, I mean, this section is a bit more technical, so I will, I will go quickly over this part. I, I just want to show you how it goes, but there are papers which, uh, where you can find all the details that you want. So here you introduce this partition function, you write down then the equation for the partition function, when, where you have uh, the partition function in discrete space. 
then because basically this equation four is too complicated and we don't know how to to use it then we go back to the data and we look at what kind of regime we we are interested in so uh, what we know is that b over r uh, which is the x that we've seen in the first part, uh, you remember, always the x was close to 1. So here we are going to do the same. b over r, which is the old x, is always close to 1. And d, the spatial diffusion, is always comparable to r minus b. Okay, in this, uh, starting from this, you can introduce uh, two different uh, um, parameters, which are epsilon and eta. Uh, which are defined in this way, and you consider a regime in which both they go to zero, but in a way that uh, the ratio is uh, order one, and also b over b naught is order one. Okay, if you do the calculations, you do all what, uh, I mean, all the proper uh, calculation, you end up with this new equation five equation for the partition function, and uh, eventually it, it turns out that you can introduce a new a new um, partition function for the global patterns, the, for the patterns basically for the random variables that you need in order for you to calculate the uh, species area relationship and the spatial species abundant distribution. This can be derived directly from the partition function and you uh, end up with this equation here in which you have this Laplacian here of f of v which introduces the spatial effects. So the effects, the spatial effects of what you are looking at or what you want to derive are enclosed in this term, in this function f of v. Now, to cut a long, a long story short, basically it turns out that we know this function f of, f of v, but uh, the, the really crucial point, the really important point is that when you introduce this, uh, when you introduce uh, f of v into the equation, basically, miraculously, this uh, integral of a Laplacian disappears, and you end up with this function, with this equation six, equation six, in which you have just this term, sigma, capital sigma, which is proportional to the Fano factor. And the Fano factor basically is telling, tells you um, how your fluctuations deviate from a Poissonian, from a Poisson, uh, run from Poisson fluctuations. So in this, you, uh, you can really uh, <clears throat> simplify things and you can understand that basically space enters uh, the equation only through this function here. And this function here can be solved exactly. Okay, of course, in this specific regime. So here we have a stationary, a stationary distribution, which is our probability, uh, our <clears throat> species abundant distribution, which depends on space only through this sigma, uh, capital sigma uh, function. So, okay, this, uh, okay, if you want, you can also introduce time, but I don't want to look into this. But anyway, it's possible to look into uh, space. Um, also in this regime, which is basically what is interesting from the applied point of view. So in here we have an underlying mathematical model from which we can derive basically all the patterns, so we can link them in a consistent and controlled way. Uh, can we compare with the data? Yes, the answer is yes. And what, okay, here I'm going to show you what we've got for the Barro Colorado Island, but we did also for other um, for other forests and we get we got uh, comparable results. So, okay, this is just the mean number of individual per species. And I think that every, every more or less every conceivable model can uh, fit this data. Anyway, we can go ahead and we can try to, we try to best fit now the uh, pair correlation function, which is given by this model, uh, by this expression here. This is the exact pair correlation function that we can calculate from the model. Okay, now we have all the parameters, we can make some predictions. And the predictions uh, told us that basically the Fano factor is always very, very large. The correlation length is large and the correlation time is also large. So in the, uh, <clears throat> in the regime that we are considering, the model uh, is able to catch, is able to, to match the, the the empirical data 
when is close to a critical point. So when mu is very close to zero. So large fluctuations, uh, uh, so fluctuations are large and they vary uh, on large temporal scales and are correlated on large spatial scales. So now that we have the data, that we have the parameters, we can make the prediction. So we have this red curve, which is the a true prediction. We can, uh, we can say how the SIR behaves across scales. As you can see, it goes more or less on top of the data. And also we can predict how it, uh, how the uh, RS or the species of the distribution looks like at the global scale. And this is what we get from, like I said, this is a, a prediction. And also the, when we downscale the prediction and smaller and smaller scales, this goes more, is able to explain the data that we observe. And this is also for the pass of forest, so we comparable, comparable results. So, okay, third part that we are going to summarize here. So in some regimes, uh, we can derive uh, analytically spatial, spatial explicit models of community patterns, and we can link the, uh, the patterns in, uh, in, a, in a consistent way. Uh, <clears throat> It's, it seems this model is going to tell us that uh, it's the, the model, uh, if we want the model to match the data, we need to, uh, let's say, we need, uh, uh, basically it's telling us that we are close to a critical point, okay? Uh, although that's, that doesn't strictly imply that we have um, a critical behavior in this case from the data, but okay, this is at least what the, the, the model is telling. And uh, if we want, this model can also include environmental noise. So you can get all the patterns that we've seen when we have environmental noise. Uh, okay, I think that this summary, um, with this we have the third part, which is, uh, uh, so we, um, if there are any questions? Yes, there are a couple of questions in the chat. So, uh, Alfonso is asking how dependent is the model and its results on the scale of the grid? Um, actually, uh, the, the results that I've shown you are in a, in, the continuous, in a continuous approximation. So in here, we used large scales. So basically there is, uh, there is no, no dependence on the, um, on the spatial grid. So basically what we are going to say, what we assume here that you cannot go to really fine, fine scales with this because we, we, we have taken this continuum limit in space. And uh, Ankit uh, is asking, is the immigration term indicative of immigration from a source pool? If not, how is it different from the diffusion between grids? No, this, the, the, the immigration is different from, because the immigration is something that comes from the outside of the system. So diffusion uh, is uh, telling you that basically uh, individuals hop onto nearest neighbors, but are always belonging to, this, to, the, to, the, to the lattice. Instead, immigration is a contribution, uh, is contribution of species and individuals that come from the outside. So it's kind of a different, it's a, so let's say one is local diffusion, the other is global because it affects all, all the lattice. Yeah, he's asking uh, another clarification about this. Given the model assumptions, do all the species go extinct after long enough times in absence of immigration? In our assumptions, no, because we use the reflecting boundary conditions. But if one wants to study this, it's possible to understand also this behavior and the solutions that I've shown you before can account for uh, species extinction depending on the area of starting area. But this is something that I didn't, I didn't show, but it's something that can be done. Okay. And Stefano uh, is asking uh, if you could provide more details on how uh, the environmental noise can be inserted in the model. Um, <laughs> That, that's a very that's a very nice question. Uh, uh, this is something that we uh, so basically mm, uh, basic. Uh, it's difficult to explain without going into the. So uh, there is a, 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 a change of variables 
which helps you map one problem to the other. And so basically you can find uh, uh, the corresponding model by using, a, 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 of course, an appropriate, an appropriate change of variable, which maps the problem of the environmental with environmental noise into the one that we have just shown. So basically you can go from one to the other. At least, let's say, and at least at, at the course level. So when we did the 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 the, the continuous limit approach, the continuous limit in that in that situation. But but anyway, the patterns can be derived in basically in the same fashion. Great. I don't see other question in the chat, nor people with the hand raised. Okay. So, uh, Jacopo, how much time left? We have uh, about 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, so uh, may I may I move on? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Okay, let's now look into the, 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 the upscaling problem, which is somehow related to what uh, we have looked uh, into up to now, but it's on one hand, um, is, is different and it has uh, some interesting applied sides, which um, may, uh, some theoretical and applied sides. So basically uh, let's start, let's imagine to have uh, the Amazon we have in our, the problem is the form. We want to, um, let's say, predict how many species we have in the Amazon forest. Okay, of course we cannot go, uh, um, onto the Amazon and survey everything. This is too difficult, too uh, time consuming and resource consuming. So it's, uh, we cannot do this. So what is the strategy that we could use uh, in order to give an estimate of the total number of species that uh, live in the Amazon forest? Let's focus on, for example, plant species, because like I said, uh, finding out, so let's focus on one trophic level because the complete, the full problem is basically too difficult. So in here, the idea is to do the following, like it's, it is suggested by this map. So in here, we scattered around, we scattered some fine scale samples around the, the, the Amazon forest. And when we do that, we collect all possible information within one sample and all the others. So we collect all the, the species identities, all species post population, so on and so forth. Now, okay, we have, we have an incomplete uh, set of information. We have, we have some information. We, have, we don't have a complete information, but we have something. Uh, how can we basically link this? How can we use, uh, harness this information in order to upscale and you know, in order to infer the total number of species. This is the upscaling problem. So basically we collect information from fine scales samples. We want to infer, we want to make predictions about species, re species rich richness at core scales, at very large scales. What can we do? I mean, here there is a long history of different models. And for a recent monograph, you can look into this final paper by Kunin. And you have a long list of different approaches, but all more or less all of them have, have some problems and some. Let me go into what we suggested, uh, uh, starting from what I just told you now. So here, uh, Okay, there are several problems that uh, we have to face. So this, the species area relation is not additive. Uh, these uh, species are usually spatially correlated. Instead, we used uh, some uh, uncorrelated uh, distributions up to now. So there are several problems here. And most, and one of the big problems is that there are, uh, I mean, species populations varies uh, across spatial scales. So basically what we see at small scales, for example, here, when we have small number of species, the species, that, uh, the species abundant distribution has one shape, but we want to predict something that much larger scale when the shape of the species abundant distribution is completely different. So this is quite challenging. And uh, it's, not diff it's, not, it's not, usually it's not easy to come up with something that is um, 
consistent and is coherent and, con and controllable to a certain extent. However, what we have, uh, and now I'm going back to what we, what I told you before, uh, we can start from the negative binomial di distribution, which I, uh, I showed you at the very beginning, uh, which has this form here. So if we assume, so let's say for, for, we know that this can match the data quite well at the global scale, okay? So when we go down scale, so when we look instead, in, instead of looking at uh, the entire area, if we look at smaller scales, how, how does this distribution behave? So there is an important property, there is an important mathematical property, which is the following, so, uh, which basically uh, it is what we are going to use and to exploit. So basically, if <clears throat> uh, we start from a given negative binomial distribution, when all species are sampled, then if we go down to smaller scales, then the distribution at smaller scales is still a negative binomial which means that it's forming variant under binomial sampling. So, so basically, if we can, to a certain extent, start from um, a rough independence assumption, so basically we assume that for the time being, uh, let's say spatially are more or less uh, spatially uncorrelated, then we can use a, a binomial sampling. And this uh, binomial sampling, uh, when applied to a negative distribution, is telling us that even the smaller scales, uh, the negative binomial remains still a negative binomial. This is a very, very nice property which can be used and can be, uh, with this we can somehow um, avoid the problem that I was uh, talking about before. <clears throat> so uh, what happens? So in this case, <clears throat> if you, so here, this is what you have to do when you apply the binomial sampling to your um, negative binomial distribution. When you do the calculation, you end up with this expression here. So it is still a negative binomial. But now, as you can see, there are two interesting features. R, one of the two parameters, does not change across scales. So it is an invariant, a scale invariant parameter. But x changes with scale. And you get this x at, OK? But this x set now can be inverted. So now you can get x, which is the parameter at the global scale, as a function of the parameters calculated at smaller scales. So this is telling us the following interesting uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, suggestion. So here we can, when we sample uh, with when we sample our area with fine scales uh, samples, we can measure this x hat and p and r and then by using this formula which is, which can be uh, deduced straight away from the approach that i've just shown you can upscale and basically uh, say what's going on when uh, uh, so basically you measure sp which is the number of species at scale p and by measuring x hat and then x as a function that is outlined here you can infer the total number of species uh, <clears throat> more details are here, but basically this is the uh, this is the idea, and this uh, we can do this simply because of this nice property of the negative binomial. By using this, we can infer, for example, the total number of species in the Amazon forest, which is kind of a uh, modifies previous. Uh, estimations here. And here there is a list and now we can go, uh, I, if you want, I can explain what we did here. But anyway, it's possible to find out uh, how many species, at least in, in some specific um, uh, ecosystem with one trophic level, what kind of um, distributions and what kind of predictions we have. Of course, we have also the species abundance distribution. So when instead we have, we do have some correlations, then we have to use a kind of more uh, phenomenological approach, but still working. Uh, and this is, uh, and this just going quickly through this model to this approach is the following. So we start from a given SAD, a species abundance distribution. In this case, we can pick a, uh, let's say, a, <clears throat> a two parameters, uh, <clears throat> SAD. Then from this, we can pick another 
uh, we can pick another spatial correlation here with two parameters as well. And from this, we can calculate the spatial variance here. At this point, we can make a link. So we substitute to alpha and beta, alpha and beta here, two functions, alpha of r and beta of r. And we set these coupled equations, integral equations, integral functional equations, actually. So in here, you uh, impose that these equations self-consistent equations satisfy these two equations. And these are equations for alpha of r and beta of r. It turns out that in some situations, alpha of r and beta of r can be, fine, can be found um, exactly. And when you have this, you can make some predictions. Uh, how does it work? I mean, it works fine. And here you have an application to the uh, breeding birds. Here you have some um, more or less 1,000 plots in, uh, in France, you apply this machinery. So you try to best fit the data with this function, but you can use another function. It doesn't matter. You can do it again and you can do it uh, anyway. And then you can predict. So here you have more than three order of magnitudes here. And we, we uh, in France, uh, I have been told that there are more or less 300 species expected, even though I didn't find official predictions. And with this model, we predicted 330 species with by taking into account this kind of correlations. So, okay, this is the upscaling model. This is the upscaling approach and I'm going to finish now. So we have this uh, modeling community. Uh, this is has interesting um, <clears throat> theoretical pro, uh, aspects which are related to the hyperdominance of species, which is still an open question. If we, if we want, we can go into the details of this. Uh, we can also, <clears throat> if there are spatial correlations, um, if there are not, we can use the negative binomial distribution, which uh, is robust under scale, uh, under scale uh, uh, variation. So, and this is because we have this form invariance. And uh, in any case, if we don't have this, uh, advantage and we do have spatial correlations and these correlations are important, it's still possible to make some predictions with a more phenomenological approach and we can predict the species abundant distribution and the species error relation. This approach uh, can tell us basically not only how many species we are, uh, we are missing, but also what is the distribution of uh, uh, populations among species that are yet to be observed. Uh, okay, I think that I'm done and uh, I just wanted to thank you everyone. Here is our lab, the LEAF lab, and here are the collaborators. Uh, of course, what I presented is the result of um, deep interaction with all people. So I'm in depth with all these people without whom I couldn't get anything of what I presented. Thank you very much to everyone. And uh, thank you, Jacopo. Thank you very much, uh, Sandro, for the very nice uh, lecture and overview of these results. Um, so uh, there is time for a few questions. So please, if you have any, um, raise hand or uh, write in the chat. Well, uh, since no one is asking, I have a question myself. So, uh, oh, actually there is one, so I'll give priority. So Silvia is asking, uh, does the change of the X parameter under rescaling of the negative binomial distribution reproduce the different shapes of the uh, SAD at different scales? Yes, 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 yes. It, it, in fact, it goes from, uh, one mode from one, uh, let's say, uh, internal internal mode to the distribution where there are no no in, no internal modes. From basically from internal peak when we have the negative binomial behavior to the Fisher log series behavior when the mode is always uh, in the first class. Great. Any other question? Well, then I asked the question I wanted to ask. So uh, one thing that uh, it's uh, um, surprising for me is that um, it seems that the same distribution hold across uh, several uh, orders of magnitude in scale. And uh, um, somehow it's- are you, are you referring to the upscaling problem? 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. And somehow, I mean, these uh, um, the negative binomial is uh, at least at least partially justified mechanistically with uh, yeah. models, right? And uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, sort of believed that the neutral uh, models or neutral theory works well um, at the local community scale because uh, individuals are relatively few and there is uh, and demographic specificity is more is more important. So I, I wonder, I mean. The fact that uh, it seems that it works also for much larger scale. Uh, no, but, but you see here, um, actually, probably I should have been more, um, I should have been clearer. Uh, when I address the, pro the upscaling problem, I'm not making any assumption about species. So in the first part, it was model dependent and I assume neutrality. But in the second part, when I explain the upscaling problem, in that case, I just use the negative binomial. Mm -hmm. So. I'm not saying that uh, I'm not saying that I'm using the negative binomial because I'm assuming neutral uh, neutral theory. This is just an, uh, I'm just using a, a distribution because of its nice mathematical properties. I could have derived this from a non-neutral model or whatever. I, we are using the uh, negative binomial simply because it has this form invariant. So there are no assumptions uh, in using that. So that's probably answers your question or i don't know uh, partially so it's, the reason why it works is because of the flexibility of the negative yes binomial. yes that's the point that's the point it's very it's very it's very flexible that's the point yeah. any other question bert ah bert um are there obvious examples of when the continual approximation fails um when discreteness is important um, so this is a question for the spatial model. I guess so. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Here, uh, uh, there are uh, I, um, there are two two things that there are two continuous limits. One continuous limit is referring to the uh, basically to the individuals. So uh, I this is one continuous. The other continuous limit is the continuous limit in space. Uh, so. <clears throat> the, I mean, the approximation, the discreteness of population uh, is uh, less important than the other somehow. Uh, when you use the continuum limiting space, uh, yes, there is a limit. Basically, it, when you go down, uh, when you go down to uh, scales as small as, mm, let's say, compared to meters or tens of meters, basically. Uh, this this doesn't doesn't work very well. So basically, when you go down to scales that are much much less, much much smaller than the correlation length, then there are there are differences. And basically, you cannot use um, you cannot use the approximation that we used. But anyway, um, uh, this is a, a model which was devised for. Um, for large scale, for macro, for macro scale patterns, not for small scale patterns. Great. Uh, so Bert is satisfied. So if there are no other questions, uh, well, um, thank you, Sandro, uh, very much again for.